saw the mysterious person at this point. We hurriedly replaced the flags and circled back towards the beach, assuming it was a groundskeeper or someone working at the golf course that had come out to scare us off. It was weird that they hadn't shouted or really moved at all, I thought, as we were running back down the dunes. Now by the time we had made it back to the beach and safely away from golf course property, I had realised something. The figure had been standing at the edge of the dunes at the opposite end of the course from the clubhouse. Either they had crept in a wide arc around us with no light, only to stand there menacingly and surprise us, or they had come up the dunes from the beach. By now, the sky was lightning, though not enough to make out any details on the ground without our torches and a low ha, ah, which is sea fog, was slowly sweeping over the empty beach. We were just discussing where the figure had come from and debating whether it was really a person at all. Some of us hadn't seen it clearly. When we caught sight of the figure once again, This time it was standing in the center of the beach, directly ahead of us, and it was close, close enough for me to realize just how tall it was. It was well over six foot. It was close enough for us to clearly see its arm rising before the torch came on again, shining directly at us. We froze in unison and we stared for a moment. I was too surprised and afraid to think of what to do. The figure was standing there, right in front of us, blocking our way home. Then it stepped forward, a long stride, and then it was walking towards us purposefully. We panicked and broke, scattering. Some of us ran back up the way we had come along the beach, and some of us ran up into the dunes. At first, I followed one friend along the beach, away from the figure. Glancing back, I saw just how fast it was moving, and I just wanted more than anything for it not to be walking towards me. So I darted off to the side, scaling the dunes frantically, too afraid to look behind me, should the figure be there following. I made it to the top, and I glanced down. I couldn't see it, or any of my friends down at the beach, but I only allowed myself a moment before I was running again. Now, along the top, of the dunes, I was keeping my head low, and I was hoping to sort of circle around and avoid the figure and whatever was happening down there. I eventually made it to the outskirts of my city, climbed over two garden fences, and made it to a street. Despite not knowing exactly where I was, I was so relieved to be back under the artificial lighting of the street lamps. The sun was just about poking over the horizon and it felt like I had just escaped from a dream world back into the safe reality of cars and street lights and houses. I made my way home at a jogging pace and I checked our group chat only once I had snuck back into my room and was safely in most of us have made it home safely, all with stories of running ages out of our way, hiding in various places. One guy had even gotten lost in the fields by the beach, and had ended up following the lights of the main road back to the city. All but one of 
was a Sunday, but then on the Monday, he didn't come to school either. We were getting seriously worried at this point, as none of us had heard from him. One of us decided to ask his parents, who said that he was fine and just feeling a bit under the weather. Okay, Jack was off school for the next two weeks, and when he did eventually return, he was acting um, differently. He seemed quiet, and while we still hung out, it didn't really feel the same. When we asked him about the night he disappeared, he claimed to have no knowledge of it, or of that night at all for that matter. He didn't seem to me to be lying. In fact, he seemed to think that we were playing some sort of joke on him. Over the next few years we sort of drifted apart, but I still wonder what really happened to him that night and what that figure was. First of all, can I just say that Clyde is an incredibly good descriptive writer. I don't know about you guys, but as I was reading it to you, I could just see it happening before my eyes. It's a very terrifying encounter, especially because these boys, I'm assuming they hung out a lot together and, you know, it's just what they did. You're not technically allowed to break into a golf course, but it's just, like I said, just innocent teenage fun, right? It's what you do. But can you imagine how scared these teenagers must have been when they saw what they saw in the dunes? I obviously can't make a determination on what this figure was, but I mean, I doubt it was an actual human, seeing as at one point they were close to it but they still couldn't make out, like, any details, and seeing as it was so incredibly tall, and it moved in such a distinct way. Have you all seen that horror film called It Follows? That scared me so much. That film, it's basically, um, this curse that you can pass on um, to the next person to free you of it. And there's something following you all the time. They're not running, they're walking, kind of like fast-paced, but they're always moving. And you can run away from it. You can take a plane, fly to the other side of the world, but eventually it'll catch up with you. And that's what this story sort of reminded me of when the figure was chasing them. I mean, when I saw that film, I thought it was a very interesting concept and very terrifying concept, but to then read this account that actually happened, I can't imagine what it must have felt like at that moment. I'm glad Jack eventually turned up wonder what happened to him. It seems strange that he wouldn't have any memory from that evening at all, while the other boys all vividly remembered this. I mean, Clyde even vividly remembers this, and it was 14 years ago, or I can't remember exactly, over a decade ago. I'm glad that Jack turned up. That's all I can say. I mean, can you imagine losing a child that way? Like, just vanishes. I'm glad he turned up, but I do wonder. I do wonder what happened to him. I would love to know.
was sent to me by a subscriber who calls herself Cinnamon Bum. Their Reddit handle is Cinnabun Bun. Their story is called There Might Have Been Something in My Grandparents' House. I'm a bit skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. I think it probably exists, but not in the traditional spooky white ghost sense of the word. Personally, I never really had the paranormal experience in my life, and until recently, I thought that I might just not be sensitive to it or something. Ghosts don't want to vibe with me, I guess. A while ago, I was fighting with my father over some family issues. My parents both are quite the drinkers, and I experienced lots of mental abuse in my life. I'm just gonna give a bit of a trigger warning for this story. I might be censoring some of the words. Um, but we are going to talk about domestic violence in a way, not in great detail, but it will be mentioned. So if that is something that sets you off, then maybe skip to the next story and refrain from listening to this one, okay? Just trying to look out for you guys. The abuse was never physical, luckily. Although I was always certain that it was bound to happen, and it never did, even though my mother had a tendency to not be careful handling me when I was a kid. Alright, sad backstory set. Let's continue with the interesting stuff. Back when I was a young child, my parents and I, and sometimes my older half-sister as well, but we'll get to that, used to visit my grandparents on my mother's side. They lived in a, from the outside, pretty normal looking house with a large yard to the side and the house had dark brown roofing. There was also a small garden in the back and a staircase which led to a huge open attic. And oh boy, that attic. Firstly, there were no lights in there. It was only a small window. And if you were lucky, a few rays of sunshine came in through there. Other than that, it was always dark. Always. It could be the brightest and warmest of days. Back there, it was always cold and dark. Now, I've got to be honest, I don't really know what the attic actually looks like in detail since I never made it past those few steps leading up to it. I always started to scream and cry whenever I looked up there. Again, there was no door which could prevent me from looking into it. It wasn't just like the cry of an upset child, but I was terrified and frozen in place. There were a couple of instances where I had one of those fear episodes and all I was able to do was scream for my parents since I couldn't physically move. I remember it clearly. Someone or something was always staring back at me. At first, it only was a feeling of being stared at. My grandparents were quite abusive towards their children. That probably led to my mother not being the healthiest, mentally speaking. I won't go further into that, but let's just say that I haven't talked to her in three years and my therapist still tries to get me over some of the things that happened. I am certain that something malicious lingered up that attic and it got more active the worse the 
situation with my parents and grandparents got. On one instance, when my half-sister actually came to visit as well, she was abused quite a bit by my grandmother, both mentally and physically. She got screamed at and slapped a couple of times. I watched it happen, hiding behind a door. Pretty awful, but I was like five years old, so there was little I could do anyway. After that, the attic thing got worse. I hated sleeping in my grandparents' house. It always had a sinister feeling at night. I also felt quite uncomfortable, although the house was actually rather pretty looking. I think it was after the incident with my sister that the things in the attic got worse. Once again, young, innocent me on my way back from the little garden, just looking at that damn thing out of the corner of my eyes. I saw something and it stared back at me. I don't remember exactly what it looked like. I know that it was humanoid, though. It was just very, very dark. I'm not sure if I could see eyes either, but I sure could feel them. All of a sudden, it moved. Rather quickly at that. It wasn't coming down towards me, but it was going further back into the attic like it was running away. Mind you, all of my family members were in the house and there was a large fence around it. This also happened during the day, so I doubt that it was a burglar or anything. That's somewhat where the memory ended for a bit, at least the scary part. I got unconscious for a bit at the exact same spot that I was standing at from sheer fear. I do remember waking up on the hard floor with my face to the staircase. Everything was really cold. It was hard to move because of how afraid I was and the fear I felt. I just felt incredibly heavy. I made it to the house and told my family what happened, but of course, they did not believe me. They didn't even look concerned, which, in hindsight, was kind of stupid and hurtful. I mean, it could have been a burglar after all, and they weren't concerned at all. But then again, that wasn't too surprising. I don't remember anything like that ever happening again. We also stopped going there since my mother stopped having any kind of contact with her family. What I haven't mentioned yet were the nightmares, though. Some of them, I'm not even sure if they were just that, a nightmare, or they actually happened. Some of them were just me walking through the house of my grandparents at night with no light on. Again, terribly scared and feeling heavy. Sometimes there were black shadows in some rooms, like what you would describe shadow people to look like. There's no guarantee here, though. I don't remember too much about it. I think some part of that presence followed me into my own home, though. I always got the feeling that I was being watched at night. And the whole apartment just felt wrong. Awful things have happened there since, including a teacher in the flat above us taking her own life. And I wouldn't be surprised if there actually was something. It never did anything, but there's no doubt. 
this is such a horrible story for many, many reasons, obviously. I think that the, the abuse that Cinnamon suffered made this whole thing just ten, twenty times worse. I mean, you already feel alone and you feel vulnerable and scared, so I guess that could influence either your perception of things happening or in a way you attract these things happening to you, these scary experiences that you go through. The fact that she was having these recurring nightmares as well about walking through her grandparents' home in the dark, no lights on, shadows lurking in the rooms. I mean, that suggests me the sheer fear that she must have felt, the sheer uncomfortableness that she must have felt in her grandparents' house. Now, I'm not saying that she didn't see anything or nothing happened. No, not at all. I 100% believe what she saw. But I just think that this whole thing is amplified by the abuse she suffered and how she felt and how scared she was and how alone she must have felt. Do you see what I mean? It's always, it's always a hard one. I mean, I feel horrible when people have to go through that and there's nothing I can personally do about it and it, it shouldn't happen. Things like this shouldn't happen when, I promise I'm not going to make this too long about this subject, but when you're a parent and you choose to have kids, you choose to put a new human life into the world, it is your duty to protect it with all you've got. It's your duty to love it, to, to make that life that you put into the world feel loved and appreciated and supported and listened to and safe, above all, safe. And it, it just pains me when I hear accounts and that doesn't happen. So I just I just wanted to share that with you guys but I won't I won't talk too much about it. Uh, but at any rate this is an incredibly an incredibly terrifying experience. If you don't feel safe in your own house or in you know the house that you're staying in whether it be a friend's house or family member's house. I just feel it, it always makes it so much worse because especially when you're a child, there's no option for you to leave there. That's where you live. That's where you're supposed to spend the night. And I can't imagine how terrifying that must have been for her. I'm glad she stayed safe though. I guess that's really the only, you know, silver lining that I can take from this story. I'm glad she is safe now. I'm glad she stayed safe in this situation with the figure lurking in the attic. But definitely a terrifying story for many reasons. one from Reddit, 
and this one was originally posted by a Reddit user called Stinky O13. Not me laughing over him. Their story is called Screaming Ghost Lady in My Kitchen. I stay with my dad on the weekends when he doesn't have to work. He lives in a flat that is part of a row of about four or five small flats, and we live in the one in the middle. Now the neighbours that we have are relatively quiet people, so we quite like our little spot tucked away from the street. Now the flat consists of two bedrooms, a kitchen, a toilet room, the bathroom, the garage, and the living room. The kitchen is sort of tucked away, pointing out towards our small backyard where we grow veggies when it's their season. That is wonderful. I wish I could do that. I don't have a garden. We're sheltered from noise from the street by large townhouses that are anywhere between three to four stories each, basically forming a wall around us. A couple blocks down is our city's biggest cemetery. Of course, that's the most haunted area in our city. I wasn't one to believe in the paranormal, but these experiences that I've both been through and undoubtedly continue to go through changed that for me. About a year ago was my first encounter with this screaming lady. I walked out of my bedroom and walked down the hall into the kitchen, expecting it to be empty as my dad was at work, filling in for a couple hours. I said something along the lines of your home early, Dad, as I noticed a shadow leaking out onto the hallway floor. When I walked into the kitchen, instead of seeing my dad, I saw no one. I was confused, of course, but I chose to ignore it, pinning it to the fact that it was about two in the morning and I was pretty tired. I turned the kitchen light off, finding it odd that it was on in the first place because I was sure that I turned all the lights off when I went into my room. I went back to my bedroom and I sat in bed, scrolling aimlessly through TikToks. I don't know if I heard something or if I just saw the light change out the corner of my eye. Half an hour later, I remember seeing the cracks around my door light up, just like they do when the kitchen or the hall light is turned on. Now, I was pissed off at this point. My dad told me that he would message me when he was on his way back, and if he was trying to prank me, I was not in the mood for it. I got up and I left my room, storming down the hallway, ready to tell my dad not to even try it. But I stopped, right in the middle of the hallway. There was someone humming quietly. It sounded like a sad song, certainly not one that I recognised. I felt uneasy and I reached into my dad's room, grabbing the large flashlight that he had tucked behind the bedside table in case our power went out or something went wrong in general. I just remember walking, the flashlight shining out in front of me, ready to beat anyone who was potentially trying to break in or steal anything. Now, when I walked into the kitchen, it was just a woman standing there, 
was dressed up like she was going to dinner in my kitchen. I must have made some sort of sound in my confusion because she turned, locked eyes with me and screamed. I screamed. We both screamed. By the time I could calm myself, she was gone. The kitchen looked empty again and it didn't feel quite as dark. Now this woman, she didn't have a face as such. Every time I see her, she doesn't have a face and she does the same exact thing. She just turns around and screams. Even when my dad is home, I hear her screaming. It sounds like she's screaming right in my ear. Now, what's strange is that Sometimes when I see her, I feel a weird sense of calm when she's not screaming, of course. That doesn't mean I like her. I don't like her. I don't like the way she locks eyes with me first, despite her lacking eyes. It's like I can feel her eyes land on me. I feel like prey stuck in the path of a large beast. She isn't good at all. Now, after the second time this happened, I told my dad. He told me it was just me feeling lonely. I've been struggling with depression recently, and he told me it could just be my mind playing tricks on me. He told me that it was my mind looking for a, a reason to project issues into physical challenges, but I don't think I can link a screaming, upset lady from the 1940s to depression. I then dug a bit. I went to the cemetery with my dad, saying I simply wanted to pay my respects to the people who had passed and see if maybe his depression theory wasn't entirely impossible. Maybe I had seen her somewhere when walking by the cemetery and she made an impression on me. After about half an hour of walking around, I come across a grave with a photo frame against the headstone. It was her. I could tell because she was wearing the same exact blouse and her hair sat neatly. I won't give a name, as it feels wrong. Out of respect, I will not be mentioning anything relating to what I later found out happened to her. I did go to the library to look through their old archives and found exactly how she met her fate. Perhaps the most unnerving part is that she would have screamed before she passed. I feel so horrible knowing that there's a sad soul stuck in my home, probably reliving her final moments. I have to hear the screams. The last anyone would have heard from her are the screams. My family is in no way religious, so getting a cross or anything like that is a no-go. I want to help her move on, but I'm not experienced in that at all. She is the reason I believe in the beyond now, after all. It's weird, but in a way I now feel relatively comfortable with her being here. I don't know if I want her to leave. I don't feel quite as alone when my dad isn't home, but I do wish to hear something other than screaming. Maybe someday she'll be able to move on, on her own. I 
some sort of comfort in her being there and that they're not certain if they want this lady to go to move on that is slightly concerning to me well I used to listen to a podcast in which they told me never name your ghosts and never get attached to your ghosts because it doesn't end well so to me it slightly sounds like that's why that's what the original poster might be doing getting attached to this woman i of course feel really really sorry for the op that they are struggling with depression but i think the dad might be right in a way even if it's only that their depression is having something to do with the fact that they are now comfortable with this presence being there and we're talking about a presence who is literally screaming at them I don't know it kind of concerns me I hope that the original poster stays safe I hope that at one point she will stop seeing this lady and she won't have to listen to the screams anymore but that was a terrifying story indeed Sadly, 